from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today out of Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel is featured on this week's cattle market segment. He'll comment on the unexpected numbers from that USDA cattle on feed report last Friday and whether those will temper the recent improvement in fed cattle prices. Also today, K-State's Justin Wagner. He'll cover several principles of post-weaning calf management, all of which are important to building a good foundation for calf growth. Justin highlighted these at a recent ranch management field day. And Jeff Wickman checks in later with this week's 4-H segment. He'll talk with Cherry Nelson of the Wildcat Extension District about a new youth activity called Water Connects Us All. That and more ahead on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is Agriculture Today. Good to have you along on this Monday as our first order of business is to catch up on the trends in the cattle markets. And along with us once more, livestock economist Daryl Peel out of Oklahoma State University to do that very thing. Well, as we get into the usual recap of the past week's trading trends, we saw another week of better cash fed cattle prices. And this has been, what, three weeks in a row now that we've seen at least notable improvement in that trade? Yeah, we've had a pretty nice uh, trend in these cash-fed cattle prices. You know, and I think there's several things uh, behind that. Futures market has also been uh, moving higher, so that's supportive. Box beef market's been moving higher, so that's supportive. So, you know, we've just, uh, you know, generally had a, an improving direction in these markets uh, recently. Cash feeder cattle prices, well, those have been improving as well, but this past week, it was sort of a mixed bag there, wasn't it, Daryl? I think it might be. Uh, you know, in Oklahoma, the uh, feeder markets were pretty strong this past week, but I don't know that that's true everywhere. And so all of those things that were supportive of fed cattle markets are probably helping the feeder cattle markets on the one hand. Um, you know, and, and in a big picture sense, we've got uh, a large corn crop, even though it's not as large as it was before the windstorm the other day. But nevertheless, it's still plenty big. At the same time, you've got some drought uh, problems in some areas, and, and probably that's uh, causing some uh, unplanned uh, Uh, movement in these markets. And as we watch things weekly, we do check on the boxed beef trade. What was the story this past week there? You know, again, we've we've seen it move up pretty nicely over the last, really, about five weeks. We've had a pretty good run. In about mid-July, uh, choice box beef got down right at $2 a pound. As of uh, late uh, last week, uh, you know, we were at about two twenty-five for choice box beef. And so, uh, you know, again, uh, pretty indicative, obviously, of, of some decent demand. We Some of that was buying for Labor Day weekend, which is probably uh, done at this point. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll watch the next few weeks. We may may see this market kind of take a pause. It doesn't necessarily have to back up at all, uh, although it could a little bit. But it'll probably take a little bit of a pause uh, until after Labor Day, and then we'll sort of shift gears into fall and winter type beef markets. In a few moments, we want to spend more time on the demand side. You've posted a couple of articles the last couple of weeks on the domestic as well as export demand fronts. Let's, though, take up what will likely be a uh, market element today and maybe beyond the latest cattle on feed report out from the USDA this past Friday. And uh, uh, it's been a while since we've seen the report exceed expectations by the margin we did Friday. That's right. You know, this August uh, cattle on feed report, July placements came in uh, 111% of last year. That was well above the uh, pre-report estimates and even the top end of the range of estimates for placements. Uh, So big placement number. Marketings came in pretty much as anticipated. The on-feed total, because of the large placements, was a little bigger than expected. Uh, It rounds up to 102% of last year, uh, about 101.5% of last year's level. 
But that placement's number exceeding even the highest forecasts by market watchers. What does that portend for the market, do you think, looking ahead? Well, it may depend a little bit on how they take it. On the face of it, you would expect a little bit of a bearish reaction to that large placement number. On the other hand, if you go back and, you know, obviously we've had a lot of dynamics this year. We had a couple months of really low placements. And even if you look at the last four months, uh, in total, placements are down uh, nearly 3% on a year-over-year basis. So you kind of need to uh, sort of average out some of these month-to-month dynamics, particularly in the environment we've been in through the first half of this year. But that said, uh, there may be a little bit of a negative reaction to this big placement number. Sounds as if you don't think there'll be any longer-term consequences of those heavier placements, that this is just an adjustment, to put it that way. I think it is. I think we're just kind of getting, uh, you know, getting these flows of cattle sort of back to, uh, I hate to say normal, I'm not sure what that is, but at least, uh, you know, kind of, uh, again, sort of uh, averaging out over the last several months, I think we're moving back into a a little bit more business as usual kind of posture for these markets for the uh, last part of the year. Well, Daryl, talk a bit about some of the information you've pulled together recently for this pair of articles. And one looked at beef demand domestically amidst our macroeconomics. And we are all unfortunately familiar with what's happened with our general economy here in the U.S. You've taken a look at what's transpired the first half of this year and what may be ahead in the latter part. You might elaborate. You bet. Uh, You know, I mean, obviously we're in a recession as a result of all of the impacts of COVID-19. And so as we go forward, we're still trying to get our hands around sort of exactly what kind of impacts. I think on the one hand, it's fair, at least from my perspective, to say that uh, I think beef demand has held up pretty well through all of this with the massive disruptions we had in the food service sector, crunching all of the demand into the retail grocery side. And and that's still in play to a large extent. Uh, Slowly, we're, we're, we're bringing food service back online, but it's well below normal yet. And, you know, when you look at the broader unemployment issues and and those sorts of things, I think beef demand has been pretty resilient. Now, one of the keys to that, no doubt, was the fact that we've had a lot of support in terms of federal stimulus monies for consumers and so on. And so one of the questions going forward late in the year might be, first of all, what do we do with any continuing of that stimulus uh, kind of help that would certainly uh, be a a part of the, the question? The other thing is that we may see some different impacts as we go into the the fall and winter months just because the type of demand that we see uh, normally changes. And our middle meats, we've had grilling demand for steaks, but if you look at things like tenderloins, for example, which are a, a largely restaurant item, that demand normally picks up in the fall and winter. And if we're continuing to have food service issues and uh, folks not eating out as much, we may see a little bit more potential for demand impact. So I guess we're sort of watching a little bit with bated breath to see if we can continue the kind of resilience we've had so far in beef demand. All of that taken into account, will beef remain yet competitive vis-a-vis other meat product options out there in the domestic market? Well, you know, again, it's done really well so far through all of this. We've got large supplies of protein. That's the other side of it. We're looking at, you know, at or perhaps slightly uh, higher record uh, beef production for the year, as well as pork and poultry. So there's lots of protein in the in the domestic market, and, and obviously the role of trade becomes important. But on a domestic front, uh, beef has held up really well, and as long as consumers have income, it seems pretty apparent that they are uh, interested in spending it on uh, high-quality protein. Well, there's some encouragement in all of that on the domestic side. And that was a good segue into the other subject you addressed in another separate article, uh, meat export challenges as they pertain to beef. It was an overview of what's been happening for beef, pork and broiler trade so far in 2020. And uh, it's been an interesting scenario to watch, Daryl. It sure has. Again, enormous uh, uh, disruptions and contortions in these markets. Obviously, uh, we had the, uh, especially for beef and pork, the massive disruptions in slaughter and production uh, in April and May, and then we've been recovering from that since then. And so if you look at the dynamics across the beef markets in particular, um, you know, all of our major markets just about are down, with the exception of Canada, uh, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, uh, Hong Kong are all down on a year-over-year basis. Some of that was
was, uh, you know, looking backwards was a result of that disruption. We just didn't have the product in some cases. But the question that really lingers and, and will be important going forward is how much of that is, is due to global economic downturns that we're seeing. And, and in one particular case, Mexico, it's pretty clear that there's a major economic recession uh, in place there that's going to impact that market significantly for the foreseeable future. So that said, uh, do we see any hints of opportunistic times for selling beef abroad beyond what we're witnessing currently? Well, you know, again, I think our general expectation is that uh, most of these markets, perhaps with the exception of Mexico, will probably bounce back pretty well. Uh, And the one market is still a very small market from a beef perspective, but China, which of course still has underlying protein deficits as a result of their uh, African swine fever impacts on the pork sector, but they're buying more of all meats and they've been a strong beef buyer in recent years. For the U.S., um, you know, in in the month of June, the latest data we have, our exports to China were only 2.8 percent of total exports. That's a very small number. But in fact, we've been operating at less than 1 percent for the last uh, oh, three to four years. And so, uh, uh, you know, that market is growing is, is sort of the message. It's not going to be dramatic and it won't be a major factor probably in 2020, but it is still very positive and it has great potential uh, down the road a little ways. Well, to finish up here, and you touched upon this earlier, the uh, Labor Day retail beef needs may already be covered in the marketplace. So would that suggest that maybe fed cattle prices are going to stall out for a time? It's certainly possible. Uh, you know, again, we've had a pretty impressive run recently. I don't think it's, uh, you know, likely that we're going to see that run continue uninterrupted. And there are these question marks that we have about uh, exactly how demand shakes out as we move from the summer to the fall period. But that said, you know, it all still looks pretty good right now. So unless something changes uh, dramatically in that market, I think there's a reason for us to still be pretty optimistic, even if we do take a little uh, breather in these markets. It's uh, here in the post-Labor Day uh, time period. Well, always good observations from you, Daryl. Thanks so much. And a few weeks from now, we'll catch up with you once more. You bet. That from Daryl Peel, livestock economist out of Oklahoma State University, here on this part of Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Now for you on Agriculture Today, information that was covered at one of those Kansas Livestock Association, Kansas State University Ranch Management Field Days several days back now. This one took place in Smith County near Smith Center. The topic was managing the calf post weaning and how to get that calf off on the right foot in performance and addressing that. Our guest now, Justin Wagner. Justin, as you know, is the Beef Systems Specialist for K-State Research and Extension out of southwest Kansas. So, Justin, you set the table in your presentation by talking about how to manage calves into this post-weaning period. And it gets back to ranch revenue, as you put it. You might explain. Sure. You know, I, I always, you know, we find weaning is, is a stressful time. It's, it's stressful on the calves, but it's also stressful on producers. And I think that that in part is due to the fact that there are some years where our weaning programs go very well. There's other years where, you know, weather, other impacts, factors outside of a producer's control can really impact and make weaning very difficult, especially in the fall. You know, the other aspect is we dig deeper into you know, overall ranch production economics, and we begin to look at the revenue and what joy are the major sources of revenue on a ranching enterprise or a cow calf operation. And two of those are going to be one, the sale of calves and the sale of cold cows. If we dig a little bit deeper and we say, well, what are the factors that, that impact calf revenue? We don't get the performance that we need. We see some performance decline uh, that impacts calf weight. If we happen to have any health or any death loss during that time period, that can get very expensive very quickly. 
Uh, if we consider the value of a, of a calf in today's market is somewhere in the neighborhood of $750 on a hundred head cow herd. If we divide that back out by the, the hundred cows, you know, that amounts to uh, $7.50 per cow, keeping the math easy. But if you put that in perspective in the fact that our revenue on a per cow basis is, is often in the single digits, if it's even positive at all in some years. So, you know, those things really bring to light, I think, the importance of weaning and, and why it is a stressful time for our producers. And therefore, a producer needs to try to avoid the pitfalls that might go along with, well, for one, performance losses in the post-weaning management stretch, right? You know, that that's absolutely correct. I, I mean, I see weaning as really what we're trying to do is prepare those calves for a transition. You know, how well we prepare those calves for that, that transition, and then, then there's several things we've got to prepare those calves for, is really one of the key components to, to I think, making that process go or the weaning process go as smoothly as possible. So what goes into that preparation and making that transition smoothly? Sure. So I think, you know, the first thing to, to kind of back up and, and think about is, well, what are the what are the stressors that that calf is going to encounter to be weaned? You know, obviously we've got maternal separation. Some of the other things they're going to encounter would be moving to a new environment. A lot of programs, we're going to take those calves, we're going to pull them off the cow, and we're going to put them into a dry lot. You know, the other one that's a really big transition on a lot of operations is just a transition to an unfamiliar feed stuff. You know, we're bringing those cattle off of pastures. If they are going into a dry lot, what does that ration look like? What is that weaning program? And, and you know, the fourth one is, is really kind of cumulative. And I would say that that's, you know, a reduction in immune function just as a result of all those other stressors, maternal separation, coming into a new environment, uh, maybe having you know, fairly low dry matter intakes because we're not used to consuming the feedstuffs that are in front of us. So, you know, those are some of the, you know, as we break this process down and, and try to target specific stressors and maybe management strategies that can address those things, those, those are what I start to think about. So of those management steps, what should one emphasize? Sure. Well, I think, you know, the first one probably starts before we wean those calves, and that's having a good herd health program, mm-hmm. you know, working with a veterinarian, you know, we're vaccinating the cows. We get some immunity into the calves. The second piece of that is we know that this is going to be stressful on the calves. You know, even under the best of circumstances, we're going to do everything we can to minimize that. But if those calves get sick, are we prepared? Do we have a treatment plan in place? Do we know what products we're going to use and what those protocols look like? I think that's key as we talk about weaning and the preparation. You know, let's be prepared on our end as producers to address those things. Another big one for me is is not to add additional stressors. We know that stress impacts cattle health and well-being. It reduces performance, increases our susceptibility to disease. So, you know, if we're going to castrate calves, any of those things, we need to do those in advance of weaning. Typically, we think about doing that at least three weeks in advance Maybe if we've got to do some of those things, gather those calves, maybe do the vaccination, castration, kick those calves back out for a few weeks with the cows, and then proceed into the weaning program. The other one I start to think about is simple maintenance things that we can do, you know, cleaning the pen. You know, if calves are going to be weaned in a dry lot, do we have, you know, last year's manure buildup from the previous set of calves in there? As we get more dust during the later, you know, summer, it's dry typically, dust in that environment, you know, what's that going to do to the health of those calves and how's that going to impact? You know, the other thing is October and November and the fall in any part of Kansas can be brutal. We can get exceptionally wet and exceptionally cold. You know, we want to go into the winter months having our pens clean and scraped because if we don't and it gets to November, it may be March before we get back and and get those pens cleaned out. So we want to be sensitive to that of just making sure our environment is, is well prepared. You know, the other things I I start to think about is preparing that calf to make that transition into that new environment, if that's a feed bunk, as well as maybe the ration that that calf is going to be exposed to. And what does Uh, one focus on there? Sure. So, you know, one thing that can be done is to to feed the cows and the calves at least the components or some of the components of the weaning ration so that those calves are, are fairly accustomed to it. 
we often think about silage in, in weaning rations, you know, a common ingredient on a lot of operations. There are a number of producers that I work with that, that use a fair amount of silage and those calves transition well to it. But I think the key element to that program is that those calves have seen those feeding ingredients while they were with their, with their dam. And the same thing could be true for, you know, if you're using a commercially available starter pellet, just transitioning that calf to that ration that you're going to use in the weaning pen can go a long ways. You know, as you start to think about feed bunks, we've done some, I've been involved with some research here at K-State with some graduate students. And in the end of the result, the research, you know, essentially supports a very simple conclusion that previous exposure to a bunk matters when we bring a calf into the receiving period in the feedlot. So, so it does matter. We need to do a good job acclimating those calves to both some components of the environment, as well as some of the feedstuffs that they're going to be exposed to can go a long ways towards having a more successful weaning program. Justin, you've worked with producers on many of these kinds of approaches. Where do you see producers falter most often in as far as this transitional time, getting those calves into that uh, post-weaning stage without major performance losses or even death losses? Yeah, so one of the, the biggest challenges I, I see with producers as we get into into our preparations for weaning is we tend to always be in a hurry to get something done, not necessarily making those preparations up front. And when it comes to weaning, we kind of have this this attitude, well, let's just get it over yeah, with. Right. And I grew up in a farming ranch environment. I understand that. But I think this is one of those areas where it is a critical control point in the beef cattle production system. It's important for our revenue. It's important for those calves as we transition them, as they go on to the next segment of the industry. What happens in this stage if we, if we do run into a health issue, you know, that's going to stay with those calves all the way to the closeout. And so I think some preparation is in order. So, you know, some other common areas Calves have fairly high nutrient requirements and demands. And what's interesting is, is that the feedstuffs that those calves are most accustomed to aren't necessarily nutrient dense. And so to, to maximize their performance on a calf that has a tremendous amount of growth potential, it actually takes a fairly nutrient dense ration. And so I, I think there's a lot of maybe misunderstanding about those calves and, and maybe what their potential is. We talk a lot about the genetic potential that we put in these calves, but I would argue on some operations during this post weaning period, we really don't feed them in a manner in which we're going to be able to capitalize on that. So I think taking a look and making sure that we are providing that calf with adequate nutrition to, to allow that calf to express that genetic potential for growth that might be there. You know, those are a couple of very generic things, I guess I would say that I see that I, I think are we certainly have some opportunities for improvement on. Very well. Well, cow-calf producers, those of you intending on retaining your calves post-weaning, start giving due consideration to all of these management steps that are critical to establishing good performance of those calves and then maintaining that from there forward. Good input, as always, and timely, Justin. Thanks for passing all of this along to us. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. And he shared the very thoughts at that recent K-State Kansas Livestock Association Ranch Management Field Day near Smith Center. Justin Wagner with us, Beef Systems Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We'll be back with more for you on this Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Now in its 96th year of broadcast service, 
to agriculture in Kansas and the Central Plains. Eric Atkinson with you, and now on to today's agricultural news headlines. Well, Oklahoma State University's Darrell Peel noted it earlier, the USDA's cattle on feed report for this month coming out this past Friday. Here were the Kansas numbers from that report. Feedlots in the state with capacity of 1,000 head or more, containing 2.41 million cattle as of August the 1st. That inventory in Kansas up 3% from last year. The placements number during July, totaling 520,000 head, that was up 16% from 2019, same time. And fed cattle marketings for the month of July in Kansas, 490,000 head, up 8% from last year. And here to recap again the national numbers from that cattle on feed report, USDA economist Shale Shagum. The number of cattle on feed and feedlots with the capacity of 1,000 head or greater on August 1st was 11.3 million head, which was about 2% above a year ago, and the highest August 1st number since the series began in 1996. During July, feedlots placed about 1.9 million head, which was about 11% above a year ago. During July, the number of cattle marketed by feedlots in the U.S. was was just under 2 million head, which was 1% below a year ago. That's USDA economist Shale Shankham on the new cattle on feed report out from the department on Friday. Blue-green algae, that aquatic organism existing naturally in freshwater lakes and ponds, sometimes reproduces rapidly, and it does create that dense growth called a bloom, which can be toxic. Cattle deaths have been reported in Kansas this year, and the deaths of seven dogs in three states last year linked to blue-green algae. That problem often shows up in the heat of summer. In northeast Kansas, Meadowlark Extension District Livestock and Natural Resources Agent Jody Holthouse and Extension Watershed Specialist Will Boyer set up a pilot project this summer through a collaboration with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Using previous studies as a starting point, this project involved placing bales of barley straw at least halfway submerged around the edge of ponds known to have previously had blue-green algae. The earlier work on larger bodies of water had indicated that when barley straw decomposes, polyphenols and other chemicals are then released that suppress the growth of harmful algal blooms. Barley straw bales used in the study were sourced out of western Kansas, and a cooperative project was started with Shawnee County Parks and Recreation, the Army Corps of Engineers, and K-State Research and Extension. It involved eight privately owned ponds stretching across Jackson, Jefferson, Nemaha, Shawnee, and Greenwood counties, the ponds ranging from one half acre to three acres in size. And Jolte says that the researchers have found that the compounds resulting from the decomposing barley straw will not kill existing blooms, but can suppress growth of new ones. The KDHE is testing the water in the ponds monthly until October to monitor the nutrients and other components that contribute to blooms and to learn how water turnover, algal species present in the pond, and other factors affect the success in suppressing algae growth. So far, says Jody, the results appear to be promising, but that they will be relying on the scientific data analysis to know for sure. Anxious to see where that work goes from here. Perhaps the most essential part of any fall calving kit for you cow-calf operators is a protocol with procedures and emergency contact information, according to one Oklahoma State University specialist. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. One significant piece of a fall calving kit put together by a cow-calf operator is what is found perhaps posted in the calving shed or barn where the kit is located, a protocol or plan. Oklahoma State University Emeritus Scientist Glenn Selk says this should be posted in plain sight with large letters and some very important information. Who to call when we determine that this cow or heifer needs our help and it may be something that we can't do alone. So the phone numbers of local veterinarians and family and friends to contact when assistance is needed, for example. Also, stages of cow and heifer labor with length of time expected, so... This gives us a guideline as to how long we're going to watch if she 
she's not making real progress at that point in time, we probably better get her up, examine her, and see if there's something going wrong that we can make an adjustment to and apply some assistance and help her deliver it. Plus steps to assist in the calving process. There's other things that you might put on that protocol as to remind them to not pull that calf until you check to make sure that the cervix was totally dilated. You may remind them that the hips probably need a one-quarter turn in order to best match up with the opening of the pelvic opening as they go through the pelvic canal. Backwards calves, special situation there, they have to be delivered quickly. Generally, once you see the baby calf's tail showing up, coming out, and you're extracting that calf, that has to be done in four minutes or less in order to make sure that calf survives. And then lastly, it's how to get that calf started breathing, especially with the backwards calf. I always put a note on my protocol to briskly tickle the nostril of that baby calf, make him cough, sneeze, snort, whatever, to get those lungs opened up, get some air in there, and get that calf started breathing. So those things can be on your calving protocol. And I think having that on there as reminders for our hired hands and for our family members that are working with these cows and heifers can be pretty helpful in the long run. I'm Rod Bade reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And on the calendar this week, K-State Research and Extension will be hosting a pair of virtual field days to share updated information on several crop production practices. The Agricultural Research Center at Hayes hosting its fall field day this Wednesday, the 26th, from noon to 1.30. And then the next day, the 27th, the Southwest Research and Extension Center in Garden City hosting its fall field day virtually once more from noon until 1.30. It'll be online, free to attend. You're asked to register in advance. You can go to southwest.ksu.edu and find the link to that. The topics for the event on the 26th Wednesday, new herbicide-tolerant crop traits and weed control strategies in western Kansas, the role of temperature in insect population dynamics, dual use of cover crops in dryland systems, and sorghum hybrids for early and normal planting. Then the program on the 27th, alfalfa and corn insect management strategies, dry land cover crop research in western Kansas, expanding cotton recommendations, and bee diversity in active croplands in western Kansas. For more information, you can contact the Western Kansas Agricultural Research Center, 785-625-3425, or the Southwest Research and Extension Center, 620-275-9164. Jeff Wickman and this week's 4-H segment coming your way next on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. The 4-H Ag Innovators Experience is a program that helps young people develop skills to feed a growing population by increasing awareness and an interest in agriculture innovation and careers. The Wildcat Extension District received an Ag Innovators Experience grant in February. 4-H Youth and Volunteer Development Agent Cherry Nelson and a volunteer accompanied three Kansas team leaders to training at Iowa State University. There they were given a challenge to reach 1,000 youth with this year's program titled Water Connects Us All. Cherry, the Ag Innovators Experience grant came through your district and you were able to put this to good use. Well, we have been. We accepted the grant back in December, and in uh, February, I took three keen leaders and one volunteer from the Wildcat District to Iowa State University. The program is sponsored by National 4-H Council and uh, Bayer Corporation, so this is a great opportunity for kids to learn about agriculture, different careers, and whatever the challenge is for this year, and this year's challenge was the Water Connects Us All Challenge. So when kids first heard that, they're like, what does that mean? (laughs) So it was kind of, uh, it was fun. It was a great experience. And our volunteer also uh, works for the Conservation District here in Wilson County. And so she had a lot of good ideas going into that as well. So we've been able to put her to good use as well. 
This is kind of based around the fact that we're going to have to be feeding more people in the future and finding ways to do it? Yeah, somewhat. I mean, you know, I think, you know, water is the most important thing that humans need, all of us, all around the world. And so the the gist of this, the first thing they did when we got to Iowa was they put up a huge map of the United States with different colors for all the rivers and things like that. And the, the water connects us all was showing the different watersheds in the United States. Well, the seven states that are involved with this grant are all of us there in the Midwest, um, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, we had some from Minnesota, Nebraska, Missouri, and Oklahoma at this training. And when you look at the map of the watersheds, we live in the largest watershed in the country because we live in the Mississippi watershed. So all that water, of course, you know, from north to south runs into the Gulf of Mexico. So we were talking about the hypoxy zone there, you know, the dead zone along the Gulf Coast and how water pollutants from far north to south really affect our our water quality. So it was it was a very eye-opening experience for those kids, especially if they'd never thought about it that way. You mentioned that you were doing this early on in the year. Then, of course, COVID-19 mm-hmm. comes into play. So what adjustments did you have to make in order to do the projects? Well, right. We did the training in early February at Iowa State. Why they send you to Iowa in February is beyond me because it was cold and there was a lot of snow, but, uh, you know, those of us in southeast Kansas don't get that much. So it was fun, but we were able to come back and we were to train 20 more teens about this challenge and to be prepare to teach it. So we had all of that done prior to the COVID-19 shutdown. We were ready to go out and start teaching after school programs and we had all kinds of things lined up to do this this spring and summer. And then when COVID hit, you know, of course, we couldn't do any face to face trainings. We couldn't do well, we couldn't do anything for a while. So we kind of backed up a little bit the the grant. They extended our timeline for the grant. So we now have through November to reach 7,000 kids. Each state was tasked with reaching 1,000 youth. And so in May, we were able to teach the class at virtual discovery days, which that was interesting. And then here, just the last few weeks, um, we've had some teams that taught part of the challenge at um, the county fairs down here in in our part of the state. So we were able to reach some people at the Wilson and Crawford County Fairs this year. And we're looking at picking up and doing some more after-school programs, if that's going to be allowed this fall. And there's some conservation field days and things like that coming up. As I said, our volunteer works with the conservation district, so we're working with her to try to get that word out. I had several youth that um, did some videos with the different parts of the program. We have a watershed where they make their kids make their own watershed with clay and things like that to show how runoff can affect a different uh, watershed. And then they create a wetland in there to show how that wetland protects the water. And so I had kids that did some videos that we posted on YouTube and Facebook that worked out pretty well. And uh, the kids are kind of getting back into it and looking forward to trying to get into some classrooms and some various things like that to teach it. So is that the specific challenge or what was the specific challenge? There's several parts to it. The big thing we want to get across is soil is like a sponge. So if, you know, with a wetland project, if you have certain types of soil and things like that, it can uh, act as a sponge to collect nitrates and other pollutants that are in our water. There's four uh, ag engineering practices that kids learned about. Um, There was a bioreactor, bioswales, saturated buffers, and rain gardens that in those sections, the kids teach those different things to how those particular ag engineering practices can help protect our water and can absorb the different pollutants and nitrates and things like that that pollute our water and are causing the poxy zone down in, in Mississippi and along the Gulf. This sounds like a challenge that could really spark some interest in the sciences and could lead to something a little bit more exciting for them down the line. 
Absolutely. And it's been a very good learning experience so far. I, I don't think kids realize, you know, a lot of times people think water pollutants, oh, it's just ag that's putting out all the water pollutants. And so it's been eye-opening for them how industry and, you know, homeowners in the cities and things like that can put some of these practices to use as well to help with the runoff coming out of parking lots, runoff coming out of, you know, off of a factory and things like that. So some of these practices are things that, you know, and the the rain gardens in particular is something that you could do in your yard at home to help with the runoff coming off of your own lawn. I mean, you probably fertilized your, your lawn or put uh, chemicals on there for weed control and things. So there's things that all of us can do. Even though we're just one person, what we do can affect somebody down the line or somebody down the down the stream, I guess you could say. And, and uh, the kids have really enjoyed learning about that. That's Wildcat Extension District 4-H Youth and Volunteer Development Agent Cherry Nelson. To learn more about Kansas 4-H, contact your local extension office or visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.